Okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, everyone, for making it to this panel. My name is Sahil Khan. I re represent uh, Radisson Hotel Group. Uh, we are about 110 operational hotels and about 60 hotels in the pipe. Uh, we operate a hotel every four hours of drivable distance. Uh, we build hotels and operate hotels uh, across different segments, which starts from upper mid-scale till uh, uh, luxury. Uh, we will be very soon launching our uh, luxury offering in the country, and you will get to hear about it. Uh, we, we, we are building, as I said, about 60 hotels. And this, uh, th that was a brief introduction about me, and uh, this panel, which will be moderated by me, is around sustainable and smart construction. Uh, I'd like to welcome each one of you. Uh, and uh, we have today on the panel, uh, I'd like to start with the lady first, Vandana Saxena. Uh, Vandana Heads is the founder of Studio 4 Designs, uh, does excellent interior design work. Uh, then we have Bobby Mukherjee, uh, who is the founder of Bobby Mukherjee and Associates, uh, does architecture, landscape, interior design, has various offices in the country. Uh, then we have the great Mr. Chobel, who's, who's a senior <laughs> colleague of mine. I must say this, sir, I've been a great admirer of yours from my Obroy days. Uh, you've been a great mentor, somebody who I've always looked up to and uh, is now, uh, used to work for Obroy Hotels, then went on to work for Marriott, now is heading design and tech services for uh, Leela. So, so that's Mr. Chobel. Then we have Cyril. Uh, who I've also heard great things about. This is the first time we are meeting. Uh, Cyril Heads Ascentis is now based out of Sri Lanka, if, if I'm not wrong. Okay. So, yeah, business, of course, is, is in the region. And then we have Pierre Jean, uh, who is the co-founder of Archetype. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary uh, design organization, basically into master planning, architecture, engineering, project management consultancy, so on and so forth. So we have some panel questions and then I have some individual questions also for you. Uh, before, before we go on to that part, can I please request you all to introduce yourselves and we'll start with you, Vandana. Tell us about your journey. Uh, tell us how it's been like for you in the profession and let's just, let's just get to understand each other better first. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back from lunch and I hope we can have a really engaging session here. Uh, so I'm Vandana Saxena. I founded uh, Studio 4 in the year 2012. Uh, so it's been uh, a beautiful journey for me as an architect and an interior designer. Uh, I passed out of the School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi and I was very clear um, as a young student that I wanted to be an architect. And I happened to take that journey and I'm really enjoying it. I've had a bit of a stint in New York. I worked there for five years, post which I came back to India. I also have a qualification in real estate finance, so I feel that equips me to understand the owner's perspective a little better. Um, uh, so uh, as a practice, uh, we are called Studio 4 and we're based out of Gurgaon. Uh, what we are passionate about is creating uh, unique narratives and stories. Uh, and we try and uh, do something unique for every project we work on. Uh, so the cookie cutter model is doesn't, is, isn't something that sits very well with us. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, uh, people with a lot of spark and enthusiasm, and that's how we like to keep it. Uh, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. Um, I'll pass. Do I pass the mic? Yeah, or? of course. Bobby. You. Hi, I'm Bobby uh, Mukherjee. Um, I started BMA nearly 30 years ago now, and uh, we have worked all across the country, probably more than 25 locations. Uh, we have work going on at the present, and uh, 10 other countries. Uh, substantial amount of international work as well, right? St starting from the US to the Caribbean to the Africas, UK, um, the entire Middle East, um, uh, Indonesia, China as well. Um, I'm actually an architect and urban planner. This hotel thing happened by chance because uh, some of our clients, uh, I came back into the country with the Ambi Valley project. Um, which was a big uh, resort city of 10,000 acres. And one thing led to another, and you know there was a certain amount of interior works that came in, and um, it was very well received uh, by the market. And at the same time, I was also dealing with uh, real estate developers. 
And uh, the pleasure I had of working with hoteliers was very different from the real estate scene. Um, you know, you being a foreigner, you might not relate to it, but some of our um, Indian real estate clients and all can be, you know, uh, not someone you enjoy hanging out with, but when the hoteliers came, you know, they were also nice, smelling good, dressed well, eating good, <laughs> you know, like meetings in nice, uh, you know, hotels and stuff. So, you know, you, you get attracted to that. You put your energies into that. And I think, you know, one thing led to another. And now I think nearly all the hotel brands are our clients. And um, we perhaps lead the industry in terms of design and uh, had lots of successful projects uh, across the region and um, now finally we are I started from the US and now we are back there doing like a good projects in the middle of all the action as well so I really enjoy doing this part it might not necessarily pay me that much compared to real estate guys but I think having fun is more important than just money Mr. Chabal yeah hi uh, so uh, I started my journey uh, as a marine engineer. I sailed on oil tankers for 14 or 15 years, uh, completely different life, a very physical life, a great time, across all the oceans. And then one day I decided to come to hotels, spend another 14 years with the Oberoi group, uh, learned from the master himself a lot of things that went into engineering projects and stuff like that. Uh, then spent a couple of years with Taj, five years with Taj as the senior vice president of projects, and then headed Marriott for South Asia for projects and projects management. And now the design and technical services at Leela, and uh, thoroughly enjoying what I do still. It's been a long journey, uh, love every bit of it, and have had fantastic colleagues throughout the whole journey, and it's good to meet up again, everybody again at this place. Fantastic. Cyril? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cyril Jacob. I'm from France originally, but been in India now for 15 years, preaching the gospel of project management. Uh, I remember I came to Higgs uh, yeah, probably in 2007, something like that, and been coming every year since. Um, I run a company called Ascentis, whose core business is project management for hospitality. We do 80% of our business in hotels. Uh, built a lot in India and in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Africa as well. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great industry. Um, I think Bobby was talking about that it was great compared to other assets. Before doing that, I was actually selling sewage treatment plants. So you can imagine <laughs> going from STP <laughs> to hotels. I mean, my wife is very happy, you know, it's a quite a big progression in life. <laughs> um, that's it. Um, and uh, yeah, for the last two months, I've become a hotelier as well because I finally put my money where my mouth is and I built a very nice boutique hotel in Sri Lanka. You're all invited to come and visit. It's called Ahube. It's about two hours from Colombo. Um, so now I know what the owners feel, uh, go through. Uh, you understand the pain much more. Uh, they understand the pain, exactly. It doesn't have to be a pain, but yeah, the stress for sure is there. Uh, so now I've got two hats, but happy to put back my project manager hat for, for Hixa. Lovely. Pierre-Jean. Good afternoon, everyone. Pierre-Jean Malgou, I'm also French. We know uh, each other with Cyril for a few years. So I'm the co-founder uh, and general director of Archetype Group. We've been operating in India since 2004. Um, we are now, we have expanded quite a lot. We have now about 1,000 people uh, spread over uh, 26 offices in, in uh, 18 countries. We still have 14 countries uh, in Asia. So I moved back to France after 22 years in Asia. I moved back to France four years ago, just before the COVID. It was quite an experience to, to spend, uh, you know, COVID time in, in France. Um, we are very much into hospitality. About 30% of our revenues uh, worldwide are into hospitality. We have built a lot of uh, hotels and resorts all over Asia, including, including India. Um, and um, we believe that, you know, hospitality for us is also... Uh, a key element not only of our business but also of I would say our love. We were lucky enough to have as a first project uh, in Asia uh, the Amansara uh, project in Siem Reap uh, in 2002 it was our first project uh, in hospitality and thanks to Aman Resorts we have been able to ride a beautiful wave on uh, building a luxury uh, hotel and resorts uh, in Asia. 
Great, fantastic. So I'll start with my first panel question and we'll start with you, Vandana. My first question is, uh, please give us a sense of the overall landscape around sustainable and smart construction. Are we really seeing this more or these are just buzzwords in the Indian hospitality industry that we want to uh, touch upon from one conference to the other? Do you really see the landscape change in the recent past? Uh, this is a very good question, Sahil. Um, and I ask myself this question almost every day, you know, when I sit down on my desk to work. Um, so I'm very passionate about uh, sustainability as an individual. And I feel this is a very, uh, I mean, you have to be passionate as an individual to do something uh, uh, concrete in this direction. Uh, do I see enough being done uh, on the projects on ground? Uh, yes and no, both. Uh, so we've recently completed uh, the renovation, phase one renovations, which was a very large part of Sadade Goa. This hotel was built 40 years ago. And I'm sure a lot of you have been there, uh, you know, in some part of your, uh, you know, uh, travel, etc. And uh, a very large part of what we did there was actually conservation and not just design. So conservation was a very integral part of what we did. And this was intentional. Uh, this was a joint effort between the owners and us uh, to sort of take this path because it is a beautiful property, it had a strong story and it was on us to either just, you know, just go out and demolish and try and put a stamp of our own everywhere or to take a conscious call to say that, okay, we like a lot of what is there, uh, you know, it's, it's to be celebrated and it needs to be brought out uh, to its best rather than just to be destroyed and, you know, done away with. So we took this conscious call and I did this because I'm passionate about, uh, you know, conserving. Because construction is, I mean, all said and done, a destructive process. It, uh, we as an industry have a huge carbon footprint and, you know, uh, believe it or not, we're all responsible for it. Our kids are going to pay for it in the future. Uh, so we were very happy that, uh, you know, we've been able to save um, uh, so many thousands and uh, thousands of square foot of uh, Jaisalmer marble which is very difficult to source today. So it was laid really well, and we decided to preserve it. There were these beautiful skylights that were bringing in uh, natural light into the lobbies, but they were shut over the years because there were issues with uh, water leakages, etc. So we took a conscious call to open them all out, introduce, uh, you know, well-engineered uh, glass on them so that, again, the property could be flooded with natural light. Uh, and this happened because, uh, you know, we and the owners were together as a collaborative team trying to work towards uh, being sustainable. Uh, we preserved a lot of antiques and actually gave them a new lease of life. Uh, so there are a lot of pieces, pieces which have been there for 40 years, but they look entirely different because what, what, what did we do? We repolished them, we changed the fabric, but they're unidentifiable today. They're sitting in a new uh, dimensional space. Uh, so yes, we, we are working actively wherever we find an opportunity uh, to preserve, conserve, and be sustainable in various ways. Uh, there's another project where we've actually done the architecture, and I've spoken about this project a few times on other panels as well, uh, where uh, we have actually, uh, you know, uh, taken stones, uh, or sorry, uh, sort of reclaimed the stone from the land and constructed stone masonry walls with it. Uh, we have aligned our buildings in a way that we can capture natural light, uh, you know, uh, let, uh, wherever there, uh, there needs to be more sunlight, the building is oriented in a way that there can be more. Uh, so I think just conscious decisions and just being, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, conscious of what you're doing can really help build a project that can last for a long time. And if something can last for a long time, it can be truly sustainable. Uh, so yes, uh, if, if at an individual level we can make an effort and we can spend time on these intricate decisions, I think we can make a huge impact. Uh, if you talk about it as an industry, do I hear enough about it? I don't. Uh, is it something I talk to every owner about or is every owner talking to me about or is every brand talking to me about it? I don't think so. Uh, so yes and no would be my answer. Bobby? I think um, the world is talking about it. Uh, she mentioned, but I don't hear much of it from the brands or the owners. The moment um, costs and figures gets into the picture 
and being like truly, you know, sustainable and try to get a green or a platinum rating, right? It uh, it adds up to project escalation, you know, uh, costs. And then all that um, being green and sustainable, all it all goes out of the window. So how we try to do things in terms of being sustainable is to earlier our projects had a huge amount of import component and we should create really high level of high quality high finished products because of our dependence on Europe and some other countries over the years our Indian uh, products materials contracting finishing has really improved in between, uh, China was a big thing. A lot of stuff came out of China, importing it from shiploads of the stuff. Now, if you know you do a project in, in a location, and if you can source most of your products from within a radius of say 500 kilometers, I think we are quite sustainable that way. You know, we are uh, not just in terms of. Um, sustainable materials you are causing you're creating employment for the people around um, you know like e everyone's happy the project costs are also in check sure. so clients are also happy we are able to produce now a high quality of work within the budgets using all our local um, artisans and contractors and and achieving great results unlike say it would be around 10 15 years ago we did not have so a lot of our contractors and stuff have set up good machinery plants, factories. You know, they produce the same amount of goods in a record amount of time. Uh, the uh, and it's all quickly packed and you know sent. Project time takes lesser amount of time. So I think we are in a much happier state now. But again, your question of being sustainable, but no one's really talking about it. So we we do a lot of this for. You know, as, as just being true to your profession, I'm also a nature lover. I love plants, animals, trees, you know, and if I can use alternates to all this, yes, we will definitely explore it. And it's best when it's in your backyard, available in your backyard. So, Bobby, do I expect no more Italian marbles in the next Radisson Hotel that you do? Um, see, we are trying to combine, you know, locally produced. Now, that is one tricky part, the marble bit. Okay, that's because some of our mines in 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 India don't produce those colors that are considered to be internationally acceptable or pleasing to your eyes. And the real nice white marbles become so expensive that it's probably much cheaper to import them than buying it from Makarana. And these mines are nearly getting depleted. So that is one element. See, we, we can't 100% be true to it. So that is one element where we do compromise and we do land up getting stuff from outside. But I think that and, and a couple of other items, but I would say 80% we are able to do it locally. All right, sir. So yeah, it is like a buzzword. It's like everybody's throwing it around for every possible buzz, the sustainable food, the sustainable toys, the sustainable everything. But in, 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 our, in our world, I think, it starts with the vision. Uh, I think the operator, the owner, the developer, everybody has to be aligned to some kind of vision of sustainability. You know, I mean, do we all believe in it? Because at the end of the day, uh, you all have to understand that it's going to be a joint effort. It's not going to be something that's going to happen. It's not going to change the world overnight. It's going to go step by step, step by step. So it's important that there is a complete buy-in like if you're doing a management contract or if you're not even doing your own, I'll come back to our own stuff. Uh, you know, you have to be able to tell the owner why. And he has to be convinced that why we're going this route. And I think there's enough data to do that now with us to convince the person that sustainability and environment is the way ahead to go. That has to then translate into design, which is the next important part. Uh, sustainability and design, unless you don't have a design that works, you know, you can keep talking about uh, marble and stone and everything all the time. But you're right, you know, skylights, natural light, 50% ventilation, air flows, all these things make a lot of difference to the whole process. The third part is materiality. That is the most important part. And uh, 
that I think we'll be very careful about now because we have to be very choosy what we pick so that we don't deploy and don't destroy what is there with us still. So these are the three important factors for sustainability, I would think, which would drive uh, the process. Uh, do we see enough of it? Uh, yeah, I think we are seeing some changes. I do not completely agree with Bobby on saying that the cost is an implicative. Because eventually it will come back to you in the form of efficient operations. It will bring back your money. It will take your money back to the bank. Because it, it's quite okay to spend that capex cost. It's a one-time thing. It can be capitalized and you can uh, take care of that part. But eventually when your operating costs start coming down and you see the difference, it makes a lot of difference. Like today we are installing water bottling plants in all our hotels. So eventually we are getting rid of 157 tons of plastic in we're getting rid of all that. So it is right at this point in time, in the design phase, that you have a room ready for making a water bottling plant, you know. So you have to be careful how you design. Now, are people doing sustainable designs? Yes. Uh, to give you an example, we are embarking on a green field project now. And we are planning to go net zero. We are going to do IGBC certifications for all our hotels now. And in this basic design process, the sustainability part has already started. And it's very important that we all handle this process so that we don't let go of the fact that, because we are in a environment today. See, the other day I was reading a very nice article somebody put on the magazine that in Nicobar, there is uh, some massive development that's going to happen. And they're going to chop down some 100,000 trees. And somebody actually <laughs> mentioned this word as ecocide. You know, this is the first time I heard this word ecocide. I said, wow, this is a new one. So we don't want to head towards ecocide and start getting the whole planet destroyed. You know, I mean, we are not here to talk about the planet. But having said that, I think it's something that we all should wake up uh, to. Uh, as Leela and as Brookfield, we are quite committed to this drive of ours. Uh, we, we have attained a lot in the last many years. And we have a goal of going net zero by 2030 for the whole group. Uh, so there is a lot of work happening at the back end on sustainability, on environment, on social governance and everything. So we'll talk about that as we go along, surely. Great. Cyril, how about? So look, uh, I think there's definitely a lot of greenwashing going on. I think we all know that. But I, I don't think it's going to last very long because we will just not have a choice. I, know, I was reading the other day that in Northern Europe, 50 percent. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, everyone, for making it to this panel. My name is Sahil Khan. I re represent uh, Radisson Hotel Group. Uh, we are about 110 operational hotels and about 60 hotels in the pipe. Uh, we operate a hotel every four hours of drivable distance. Uh, we build hotels and operate hotels uh, across different segments, which starts from upper mid-scale till uh, uh, luxury. Uh, we will be very soon launching our uh, luxury offering in the country, and you will get to hear about it. Uh, we, we, we are building, as I said, about 60 hotels. And this, uh, th that was a brief introduction about me, and uh, this panel, which will be moderated by me, is around sustainable and smart construction. Uh, I'd like to welcome each one of you. Uh, and uh, we have today on the panel uh, I'd like to start with the lady first, Vandana Saxena. Uh, Vandana Heads is the founder of Studio 4 Designs, uh, does excellent interior design work. Uh, then we have Bobby Mukherjee, uh, who is the founder of Bobby Mukherjee and Associates, uh, does architecture, landscape, interior design, has various offices in the country. Uh, then we have the great Mr. Chobel, who's, who's a senior colleague of mine, I must say this, sir, I've been a great admirer of yours from my Obro days. Uh, you've been a great mentor, somebody who I've always looked up to and uh, is now, uh, used to work for Obro Hotels, then went on to work for Marriott, now is heading design and tech services for uh, Leela. So, so that's Mr. Chobel. Then we have Cyril, uh, who I've also heard great things about. This is the first time we're meeting. Uh, Cyril Heads Ascentis is now based out of Sri Lanka, if, if I'm not wrong? Okay. So, yeah, business, of course, is, is in the region. And then we have Pierre Jean, uh, who is the co-founder of Archetype, uh, 
Uh, it's a multidisciplinary uh, design organization, basically into master planning, architecture, engineering, project management consultancy, so on and so forth. So we have some panel questions and then I have some individual questions also for you. Uh, before, before we go on to that part, can I please request you all to introduce yourselves and we'll start with you, Vandana. Tell us about your journey. Uh, tell us how it's been like for you in the profession. And let's just, let's just get to understand each other better first. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. And I hope we can have a really engaging session here. Uh, so I'm Vandana Saxena. I founded uh, Studio 4 in the year 2012. Uh, so it's been uh, a beautiful journey for me as an architect and an interior designer. Uh, I passed out of the School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi, and I was very clear um, as a young student that I wanted to be an architect. And I happened to take that journey, and I'm really enjoying it. I've had a bit of a stint in New York. I worked there for five years, post which I came back to India. I also have a qualification in real estate finance, so I feel that equips me to understand the owner's perspective a little better. Um, uh, so, uh, as a practice, uh, we are called Studio 4 and we're based out of Gurgaon. Uh, what we are passionate about is creating uh, unique narratives and stories. Uh, and we try and uh, do something unique for every project we work on. Uh, so, the cookie cutter model is, doesn't, is, isn't something that sits very well with us. Uh, so, we are, uh, you know, uh, people with a lot of spark and enthusiasm and that's how we like to keep it. Uh, so that's that's me in a nutshell. Um, I'll pass. Do I pass the mic? Yeah, or? of course, Bobby. You. Hi, I'm Bobby uh, Mukherjee. Um, I started BMA nearly 30 years ago now, and uh, we have worked all across the country, probably more than 25 locations. Uh, we have work going on at the present, and uh, 10 other countries. Uh, substantial amount of international work as well, right? St starting from the U.S. to the Caribbean to the Africas. UK, um, the entire Middle East, um, uh, Indonesia, China as well. Um, I'm actually an architect and urban planner. This hotel thing happened by chance because uh, some of our clients, uh, I came back into the country with the Ambi Valley project, um, which was a big uh, resort city of 10,000 acres. And one thing led to another, and you know there was a certain amount of interior works that came in. and um, it was very well received uh, by the market. And at the same time, I was also dealing with uh, real estate developers. And uh, the pleasure I had of working with hoteliers was very different from the real estate scene. Um, you know, you being a foreigner, you might not relate to it, but some of our um, Indian real estate clients and all can be, you know, uh, not someone you enjoy hanging out with, but when the hoteliers came, you know, they were all so nice, smelling good, dressed well, eating good, you know, <laughs> like meetings in nice, uh, you know, hotels and stuff. So, you know, you, you get attracted to that. You put your energies into that, and I think, you know, one thing led to another, and now I think nearly all the hotel brands are our clients, and um, we perhaps lead the industry in terms of design, and uh, had lots of successful projects uh, across the region. And um, now finally we are, I started from the US and now we are back there doing like uh, good projects in the middle of all the action as well. So I really enjoy doing this part. It might not necessarily pay me that much compared to real estate guys, but I think having fun is more important than just money. Mr. Chabal. Yeah, hi. It's on. Uh, so uh, I started my journey uh, as a marine engineer. I sailed on oil tankers for 14 or 15 years, uh, completely different life, a very physical life, a great time, across all the oceans. And then one day I decided to come to hotels, spent another 14 years with the Oberoi group, uh, learned from the master himself a lot of things that went into engineering projects and stuff like that. Uh, then spent a couple of years with Taj, five years with Taj as the senior vice president of projects, and then headed Marriott for South Asia for projects and projects management. And now the design and technical services at Leela, and uh, thoroughly enjoying what I do still. It's been a long journey, uh, love every bit of it, and have had fantastic colleagues throughout the whole journey, and it's good to meet up again, everybody again at this 
Yes. Fantastic. Cyril? Hi. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cyril Jacob. I'm from France originally, but been in India now for 15 years, preaching the gospel of project management. Uh, I remember I came to Higgs area probably in 2007, something like that, and been coming every year since. Um, I run a company called Ascentis, whose core business is project management for hospitality. We do 80% of our business in hotels. Uh, built a lot in India, in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Africa as well. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great industry. Um, I think Bobby was talking about that it was great compared to other assets. Before doing that, I was actually selling sewage treatment plants. So you can imagine <laughs> going from STPs to hotels. I mean, my wife is very happy, you know, it's like quite a big progression in life. <laughs> Um, that's it. Um, and I, yeah, for the last two months, I've become a hotelier as well because I finally put my money where my mouth is and I built a very nice boutique hotel in Sri Lanka. You're all invited to come and visit. It's called Ahu Bay. It's about two hours from Colombo. Um, so now I know what the owners feel, uh, go through. You uh, understand the pain uh, much uh, more. They understand the pain, exactly. It doesn't have to be a pain, but yeah, the stress for sure is there. Uh, so now I've got two hats, but happy to put back my project manager hat for, for Hixa. Lovely. Pierre-Jean. Good afternoon, everyone. Pierre-Jean Malgou, I'm also French. We know uh, each other with Cyril for a few years. So I'm the co-founder uh, and general director of Archetype Group. We've been operating in India since 2004. Um, we are now, we have expanded quite a lot. We have now about 1,000 people uh, spread over uh, 26 offices in, in uh, 18 countries. We still have 14 countries uh, in Asia. So I moved back to France after 22 years in Asia. I moved back to France four years ago, just before the COVID. It was quite an experience to, to spend, uh, you know, COVID time in, in France. Um, we are very much into hospitality. About 30% of our revenues uh, worldwide are into hospitality. We have built a lot of uh, hotels and resorts all over Asia, including, including India. Um, and um, we believe that, you know, hospitality for us is also a, a key element, not only of our business, but also of, I would say, our love. We were lucky enough to have as a first project uh, in Asia uh, the Amansara uh, project in Siem Reap uh, in 2002. It was our first project uh, in hospitality and thanks to Aman Resort we have been able to ride a beautiful wave on uh, building a luxury uh, hotel and resorts uh, in Asia. Great, fantastic. So I'll start with my first panel question and we'll start with you Vandana. My first question is, uh, Please give us a sense of the overall landscape around sustainable and smart construction. Are we really seeing this more or these are just buzzwords in the Indian hospitality industry that we want to uh, touch upon from one conference to the other? Do you really see the landscape change in the recent past? Uh, this is a very good question, Sahil. Um, and I ask myself this question almost every day, you know, when I sit down on my desk to work. Um, so I'm very passionate about uh, sustainability as an individual and I feel this is a very, uh, I mean you have to be passionate as an individual to do something uh, uh, concrete in this direction. Uh, do I see enough being done uh, on the projects on ground? Uh, yes and no both. Uh, so we've recently completed uh, the renovation, phase one renovations which was a very large part of Sadade Goa. This hotel was built 40 years ago. And I'm sure a lot of you have been there, uh, you know, in some part of your, uh, you know, uh, travel, etc. And uh, a very large part of what we did there was actually conservation and not just design. So conservation was a very integral part of what we did. And this was intentional. Uh, this was a joint effort between the owners and us uh, to sort of take this path because it is a beautiful property, it had a strong story, and it was on us to either just, you know, just go out and demolish and try and put a stamp of our own everywhere, or to take a conscious call to say that, okay, we like a lot of what is there, uh, you know, it's, it's to be celebrated, and it needs to be brought out uh, to its best, rather than just to be destroyed and, you know, done away with. So we took this conscious call, and I did this because I'm passionate about, uh, you know, conserving because construction is, I mean, all said and done, a destructive process. 
it, uh, we as an industry have a huge carbon footprint and, you know, uh, believe it or not, we are all responsible for it. Our kids are going to pay for it in the future. Uh, so we are very happy that, uh, you know, we've been able to save um, uh, so many thousands and uh, thousands of square foot of uh, Jaisalmer marble, which is very difficult to source today. So it was laid really well and we decided to preserve it. There were these beautiful skylights that were bringing in uh, natural light into the lobbies, but they were shut over the years because there were issues with uh, water leakages, etc. So we took a conscious call to open them all out, introduce, uh, you know, well-engineered uh, glass on them so that again the property could be flooded with natural light. Uh, and this happened because, uh, you know, we and the owners were together as a collaborative team trying to work towards uh, being sustainable. We preserved a lot of antiques and actually gave them a new lease of life. Uh, so there are a lot of pieces, pieces which have been there for 40 years, but they look entirely different because what, what, what did we do? We repolished them, we changed the fabric, but they're unidentifiable today. They're sitting in a new uh, dimensional space. Uh, so yes, we, we are working actively wherever we find an opportunity uh, to preserve, conserve, and be sustainable in various ways. Uh, there's another project where we've actually done the architecture, and I've spoken about this project a few times on other panels as well, uh, where uh, we have actually uh, you know, uh, taken stones uh, or sorry, uh, sort of reclaim the stone from the land and constructed stone masonry walls with it. Uh, we have aligned our buildings in a way that we can capture natural light. Uh, you know, uh, let, uh, wherever there, uh, there needs to be more sunlight, the building is oriented in a way that there can be more. Uh, so I think just conscious decisions and just being, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, conscious of what you're doing can really help build a project that can last for a long time. And if something can last for a long time, it can be truly sustainable. Uh, so yes, uh, if, if at an individual level we can make an effort and we can spend time on these intricate decisions, I think we can make a huge impact. Uh, if you talk about it as an industry, do I hear enough about it? I don't. Uh, is it something I talk to every owner about or is every owner talking to me about or is every brand talking to me about it? I don't think so. Uh, so yes and no would be my answer. Bobby? I think um, the world is talking about it, as she mentioned, but I don't hear much of it from the brands or the owners. At the moment, um, costs and figures gets into the picture and being like truly, you know, sustainable and try to get a green or a platinum rating, right? It, uh, it adds up to project escalation, you know, uh, costs. And then all that um, being green and sustainable, all, it all goes out of the window. So how we try to do things in terms of being sustainable is to, earlier our projects had a huge amount of import component and we used to create really high level of high quality, high finished products because of our dependence on Europe and some other countries. Over the years, our Indian uh, products, materials, contracting, finishing has really improved. In between, uh, China was a big thing. A lot of stuff came out of China, importing it from shiploads of the stuff. Now, if you, know, you do a project in, in a location and if you can source most of your products from within a radius of, say, 500 kilometers, I think we are quite sustainable that way. You know, we are uh, not just in terms of um, sustainable materials. You are causing, you are creating employment for the people around. Um, you know, like e everyone's happy. The project costs are also in check. Sure. So clients are also happy. We are able to produce now a high quality of work within the budgets using all our local um, artisans and contractors and and achieving great results unlike, say, it would be around 10, 15 years ago. We did not have. So a lot of our contractors and stuff have set up good machinery, plants, factories. You know, they produce the same amount of goods in a record amount of time. Uh, the, uh, and it's all quickly packed and, you know, sent. Project time takes lesser amount of time. So I think we are in a much happier state. 
now, but again, your question of being sustainable, but no one's really talking about it. So we, we do a lot of this for, you know, as, as just being true to your profession. I'm also a nature lover. I love plants, animals, trees, you know, and if I can use alternates to all this, yes, we will definitely explore it. And it's best when it's in your backyard, available in your backyard. So Bobby, do I expect no more Italian marbles in the next Radisson Hotel that you do? Um, see, we are trying to combine, you know, locally produced. Now, that is one tricky part, the marble bit. Okay, that's because some of our mines in, in, in India don't produce those colors that are considered to be internationally acceptable or pleasing to your eyes. And the real nice white marbles become so expensive that it's probably much cheaper to import them than buying it from Makarana, and these mines are nearly getting depleted. So that is one element. See, we, we can't 100% be true to it. So that is one element where we do compromise, and we do land up getting stuff from outside. But I think that, and, and a couple of other items, but I would say 80%, we are able to do it locally. All right. So, so yeah, it is like a buzzword. It's like Everybody's throwing it around for every possible buzz. There's sustainable food, there's sustainable toys, there's sustainable everything. But in, 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 our, in our world, I think it starts with the vision. Uh, I think the operator, the owner, the developer, everybody has to be aligned to some kind of vision of sustainability. You know, I mean, do we all believe in it? Because at the end of the day, uh, you all have to understand that it's just going to be a joint effort. It's not going to be something that's going to happen. It's not going to change the world overnight. It's going to go step by step, step by step. So it's important that there is a complete buy-in, like if you're doing a management contract or if you're not even doing your own. I'll come back to our own stuff. Uh, you know, you have to be able to tell the owner why. And he has to be convinced that why we're going this route. And I think there is enough data to do that now with us, to convince the person that sustainability and environment is the way ahead to go. That has to then translate into design, which is the next important part. Uh, sustainability in design, unless you don't have a design that works, you know, you can keep talking about uh, marble and stone and everything all the time. But you're right, you know, skylights, natural light, 50% ventilation, air flows, all these things make a lot of difference to the whole process. The third part is materiality. That is the most important part. And... Uh, that I think we'll be very careful about now because we have to be very choosy what we pick so that we don't deploy and don't destroy what is there with us still. So these are the three important factors for sustainability, I would think, which would drive uh, the process. Uh, do we see enough of it? Uh, yeah, I think we are seeing some changes. I do not completely agree with Bobby on saying that the cost is an implicative. Because eventually it will come back to you in the form of efficient operations. It will bring back your money. It will take your money back to the bank. Because it, it's quite okay to spend that capex cost. It's a one-time thing. It can be capitalized and you can uh, take care of that part. But eventually when your operating costs start coming down and you see the difference, it makes a lot of difference. Like today we are installing water bottling plants in all our hotels. So eventually we are getting rid of 157 tons of plastic in we're getting rid of all that. So it is right at this point in time, in the design phase, that you have a room ready for making a water bottling plant, you know. So you have to be careful how you design. Now, are people doing sustainable designs? Yes. Uh, to give you an example, we are embarking on a green field project now. And we are planning to go net zero. We are going to do IGBC certifications for all our hotels now. And in this basic design process, the sustainability part has already started. And it's very important that we all handle this process so that we don't let go of the fact that, because we are in a environment today. So the other day I was reading a very nice article somebody put on the magazine that in Nicobar, there is uh, some massive development that's gonna happen. And they're gonna chop down some 100,000 trees. And somebody actually <laughs> mentioned this word as ecocide. You know, this is the first time I heard this word ecocide. I said, wow, this is a new one. So we don't want to head towards ecocide and start getting the whole planet destroyed, you know. I mean, we are not here to talk about the planet. But having said that, I think it's something that we all should wake up uh, to uh, 
as Leela and as Brookfield, we are quite committed to this drive of ours. Uh, we, we have attained a lot in the last many years, and we have a goal of going net zero by 2030 for the whole group. Uh, so there is a lot of work happening at the back end on sustainability, on environment, on social governance and everything. So we talk about that as we go along, surely. Great. Cyril, how about? So look, uh, I think there's definitely a lot of greenwashing going on. I think we all know that. But I, I don't think it's going to last very long because we will just not have a choice. I, I was reading the other day that in Northern Europe, 50% of the young generation just asked for it. You know, So I was speaking to somebody from Danone, who was one of the leaders in dairy. He said, we have to change our plants, we have to change all our business model because the young generations do not drink milk anymore. They want you know, uh, plant-based products. So the same thing is going to happen in hotel. Those same people are going to come and stay in our hotels, and they'll be very regarding. You know, they will be look at, they'll look at the environmental impact of their stay in the hotel. So I, I personally think by 2030, you know, any business that doesn't have doesn't have a credible sustainability strategy is going to be out of business. I mean, I, this is my personal belief, and it's going to accelerate. We're going to see it coming. You know, in the next two or three years, it's going to come very fast. So, you know, I think it's the title of this, uh, of this uh, session, you know, I think sustainability is, sustainable construction is smart construction. Because if you want to remain in business, I think you, we are, we're going to have to take it very seriously. Um, I think it's buildings represent what 28% of the carbon emissions in the world just uh, in their operations. But there's actually 10% of carbon emissions that come from construction of buildings. So that's quite a huge part of carbon emissions. Um, so I think we're like everyone at the moment, we're not doing enough. We are prioritizing other things and um, making sure we keep the costs low and so on. But I can really see this coming very soon. Um. Pierre? Yeah, I agree with Cyril, actually. Um, the fact that I've been living in France for the past four years in more European you know, mind than before when I was based in Asia, I can see a big difference between what Europe right now is doing and implementing and enforcing, because somehow, you know, all these green issues needs to be enforced. Um, of course, there is short-term pressure, as Cyril mentioned, about the fact that you still need to do business plan, but on the medium term, long term, the young, the young generation will definitely be the one driving the changes. And what has been happening with, uh, you know, yogurt in Northern Europe will happen also in the hospitality and start happening today in hospitality in Europe where you know, uh, the young generation is very conscious about going into hotels that are really not doing greenwashing, but really taking green seriously. There is a lot of, of course, greenwashing going around, not only in hospitality and real estate in general. Uh, the, the, we have a social responsibility, all of us, jointly, uh, effectively. 40% of the carbon footprint emission are coming from buildings, uh, whether construction operations, so that's huge. That's much bigger than agriculture, much bigger than, uh, you know, maritime transportation, etc., And that's true that the problem we face is that our, I would say, industry is, uh, has so many stakeholders that, of course, you know, the decision-making process to make change is implicating uh, a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of interaction. But I think also that um, we have to take things a bit more seriously. I mean, for archetype, typically what we discuss internally is that in the next five years, within the next five years, we're going to accept only green projects. It's a big commitment. I'm not sure That's we're going to make it, but it makes sense because we believe that in the end, growth or growth is useless. What is important is quality, and what is important is commitment to the planet. We, we don't want later on, and I don't want personally, I have a daughter of 13 years old, I don't want her to tell me in 20 years, hey, daddy, that's great what you've done. You had a lot of fun building a company, but in the end, what have you done for the planet? And this is, I believe, something that all of us around the table uh, will feel the same at some stage. So we all have to, to do things a bit more with maybe more constraints. I take an example, another example about green, um, I would say all the green building. There is something that the IFC started, the age certification. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. And I believe this is a nice start to really try to uh, make a, a, with more magnitude the green uh, building uh, business uh, growing up because that's true that to be very frank you know lead certification and brim certification and all these existing certification are quite costly when it comes to places like india or other other emerging markets because they have a lot of constraint that 
you will not get your return on investment in less than 15 or 20 years when you have a least certified building as, as of today. So age is maybe a way to go into green certification at a lower cost, but at least a first step, a first necessary step in order to, to go and, and promote this green certification. Because all this will come again to financing. As long as you know, the financier people still finance projects that are not green, we will keep having building not green. And in the end, it has to come from you know, the root, the source, and it has to come with having more constraint on the financing in order to push all the profession to do better. Because otherwise, I'm afraid we're going to keep on going into a, a wrong direction. And at some stage, as Cyril said very rightly, there will be a disconnection between what the people want and what we can offer. Okay. So the sense that I get is uh, we like talking about it, but there is not enough that's being done. But clearly, we don't have a choice. This will, this will be the future. And uh, the earlier we start thinking about it in a very serious manner, the better it will be. Although the intention is, 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 is all there, but it's the collective ecosystem that has to come together for us to really uh, make some strides forward. Okay. So from a panel question, now I, ha I have a question for you, Cyril, and then for you, Pierre. Uh, and this is around projects. So what percentage of projects, stroke owners and developers are keen to look at sustainability and smart construction from the entire uh, you know, nature of work that you're doing. Can you give us, some, can you share some numbers in, in, in terms of percentage that you're doing sustainable and smart construction now? So look, I, I've never heard an owner who tells me that he doesn't want to do some, something sustainable. But the thing is, just if you take lead rating, you've got everything, you know, between a, a simple lead or even silver rating and a platinum rating is day and night. So I think it's a, it's a very generic to talk about sustainability, but um, yeah, the next question is always how much it's going to cost me. <laughs> so we've got to get better also at putting a cost on that so that we can answer that question. And more importantly than the capex, not just the capex, what's going to be the payback. So we try to do it, you know, I mean, for PV panels, uh, solar panels, those kind of things, it's easy to put a payback on it. Uh, but we've got to get better at it. I, I think because the other part of the question is about uh, smart construction, right? Uh, intelligent construction. That's right. You know, for many years we've been talking about hardware, whether it's system formwork, prefab, and so on. What I'm seeing now is more and more software. You know, I mean, the construction industry is, is one of the unique industries that has negative go product uh, productivity decline over the years. Uh, I think only agriculture is the, in, the same, is in the same bag. Uh, but now we're seeing that construction is going towards digitization like every other industry. We have a huge amount of data available now on construction sites. And the challenge for companies like us, for sure, is what do we do with all this data? And uh, if we are able to harness this data, to leverage it, then I think we can really improve the productivity of construction projects and we can make better projects. So this is today what I'm really passionate about is how are we going to really digitize this industry? Uh, there's a lot of software coming up um, that help you manage this data. I mean, we all talk about AI. AI is definitely the next step to manage this data. Um, but I see, I see software being the next big thing in construction and not just hardware. Hardware is there, it's been there for 20 years. Uh, we all know it. Uh, now is how do we become more intelligent by using all the data coming from different places. Yeah, yeah it's, I have a similar uh, feeling. I mean, first of all, in terms of um, green, uh, I would say overall today, the number of green projects we have is about 20%, okay? Which, which is, a, we could say, a good start, considering that we're working in, in many countries, particularly in Asia. But when I look at the split, because we have the chance to work 50% on real estate, 50% about industrial projects. Actually, when it's real estate, it's less than 10%. The bulk of it is on the industrial projects. I believe industrial investors have taken more seriously, maybe because they have more constraint, the green aspects of, the, of their projects. So industrial projects, we go easily to almost 50%, working mostly for you know, big MNCs, of course, uh, Danone and all the kind of companies that have a big plan to, to be uh, you know, net zero, uh, 2030, 2035, and these kind of things. Uh, so real estate has not yet embraced that. And, and that's also the fact that because real estate developers overall, huh, uh, hoteliers or, or others, are also uh, 
maybe more family-owned companies, um, I would say with a less, um, um, less constraint maybe from the market, from the stock exchange market. So that's also maybe the reason why they have not yet embraced that. Um, so, so, but at least 20%, it's a start. We were at, uh, you know, 2% uh, six or seven years ago. So it's already a, a, big, a big progression. Um, in terms of smart construction, um, I fully agree on, with Cyril about the digitalization. This is something that we have thought about in Archetype for a long time. We have also uh, have a lot of data. We have our own internal tool um, that we've been using on projects in terms of uh, management overall from all the stages of the projects. And now we are thinking, we've been thinking already for the past three years about it, but the COVID delayed us. We're thinking about doing a, a kind of spin-off out of that to set up a, a, a new company in order to uh, sell this tool that is working quite well. Uh, we should hopefully by early 2024 launch uh, this, uh, this tool. There are already many tools existing on the market uh, for sure, but we believe our tool maybe is better because it has been built by us somehow professional, not by an IT company, but by us. And this is definitely where we can add a lot of added value on the market because the intelligence of data is what will help us to build better, smarter, and greener overall. Okay. Uh, my the next very important thing that we're going to see, I mean, I don't know too much about it, maybe it's too nascent, is this NEOM, which is this whole sustainable city which they're building in Saudi Arabia. That's right. I think that is going to be something that's going to be an eye-opener for all of us to see how that works because they're creating 170 kilometers of glass line and five minutes walking distance from anywhere you want. And they're creating three places like this. It's going to be something that's going to prove where sustainability actually is going to work because you have everything that is, all the resources over there that can make it sustainable, you know. So I think that's going to be a very interesting phase of construction which we can all kind of tap on and see what's happening out there. I mean, people who are really getting into it. Sorry. So. All right. So my next question is for you, Mr. Chobal. You represent a luxury Indian hospitality company and the way it's perceived to be here in India, where guest is God, even the minister was talking about, you know, uh, and that is just India, where, uh, you know, Atiti Devo Bhav uh, is our tagline. Uh, in India, hotels, uh, you know, uh, even if you walk into a three-star hotel, uh, guest has a different set of expectations from the same traveler who goes to Europe. So my question to you is, by having sustainable and smart hotels, are we moving away from traditional Indian hospitality? Uh, at least it's perceived to be like that. So can I, can I, can I have your views around this, please? Well, uh, so Leela is the Uber luxury hospitality brand, and we strongly believe in that 100%. It, traditional luxury will never change. Traditional hospitality will never change. Having said that, do we not know about sustainability? Of course we know everything about sustainability. And uh, just to cite a few points, that uh, every guest that is coming in is being made aware of what all is going on at the back of the house or even in our daily processes on what we are doing for sustainability. So just to give you an example, uh, of course EV chargers are there in all our hotels now. That's become straight up. We are in fact even going into EV cars. We are the first ones to launch the first EV boats on the lake, on the Udaipur Lake, which has been a big win for us. Uh, none of the other hotels have been able to manage that. So we've got a lot of saving of the, of the carbon footprint. Uh, we have invested almost more than 40 million in creating solar plants for Chennai and Udaipur, okay? Uh, we're going to, we have almost a 57% renewable energy for the group and for our two hotels that's, that's Bangalore and Chennai because we also have solar and windmill. We got about 86% of renewable energy out there. So there's a substantial saving that, so we are making the guests aware of all these things. We started a program called Ojasya, which is a health and wellness being program, which is again going back to local, going back to pharma, going back to organic, which is a very big win for us. Uh, Ojasya has come out as a great brand for us uh, we've launched our own bath amenities brand called Tishya, which is uh, made from a fragrance of the Nilgiri flower and the lotus. 
and uh, this one is uh, recycl completely recyclable bottles. It's uh, biodegradable bottles. So we are already doing that, you know. So this has been a big hit for us. In fact, we are entering the retail market as well. We have started a process of sending our flowers <laughs> to a unit and creating incense sticks out of it, okay? That process has also started. Uh, we have already installed water bottling plants in our hotels. So it's, it's, it's not that, I mean, luxury will always remain. I will, you will still see all the fabrics, you'll still see all the cushions, you'll see all the drapery, you'll see the chandeliers and everything. That has to be there. But we are doing enough on the other side to compensate. And uh, it's not, a, I wouldn't call it compensation. It's, I think it's our ownership to the society. It's our, uh, what we need to do for the country and for our fellow beings as well. That all these things are eventually going to add up. And of course, it operationally also makes a lot of sense because it brings in a lot of operation savings. It keeps everybody happy. And everybody's saying, today's guest is going the sustainable route. They want to know what's going on. They keep asking questions. The younger generation wants to know. So uh, it's... So you cannot take away sustainability from luxury. Now, if I make a new hotel, new construction, of course, all my design parameters will be based on wind flow analysis, solar panels, solar movements, you know, position of hotel, how much daylight. Of course, we talk about technology and digitalization. This is the BIM methodology and the building management systems. All this is spoken for, and all this has to be implemented, even if it's at a cost, you know. So, uh, like I said in the earlier statement, like uh, Leela and Brookfield are very committed to this and we want to achieve that net zero by 2030, definitely we want to try and go there. So my another question to you is, and taking a cue from what Bobby said, uh, is it cheaper to build sustainable and smart hotels from a sense of capex and opex, if you can educate us all, is it is it cheaper in the long run to build sustainable and smart hotels. Uh, do, what, what's your take on this? Luxury hotels are not cheap. <laughs> so that's the wrong impression. Uh, so, see, I mean, I've been working with various brands, okay, and various brands have got various segmentations of hotels. So it depends on what segment of hotel you want to build on. I don't want to take any names, but there is the mid-market segment, there is the middle segment, there is the entry-level segment, and there is the luxury segment, there is the uber-luxury segment. So where do you define cheapness or where do you define expensiveness? It's very difficult. At the end of the day, there is a certain amount of money that you would allocate to construction, to your MEP, to your interiors, to your landscaping, to various factors that is there. Eventually, it has to make sense to the owner or to you what is the underwriting and what is my ROI, right? Now, like you said, if you go for a lead certification, yes, but Edge is definitely the way to go. We are also working very closely with that on Edge. Uh, but yeah, do, at least we can try and get platinum, if nothing. Uh, so, I mean, as a percentage, I mean, I don't even want to give a figure to start with, you know, because it can vary from 70 lakhs a key to three crores a key. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, it's depends on what market segment you want to play in. So, like I said, but Investment in sustainability will always help in your operational recovery, definitely. I think that's a, I think that's a given. Yeah. So sustainability will help you operate hotels in a much more efficient manner. Efficient manner, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So, so here we have it. Okay. My next question is to you, Vandra, and then I'll come to you, Bobby. Uh, tell us more about how interior design can contribute towards sustainable and smart construction techniques. Okay. Um, that's not an easy question. Um, so as I said initially, it's all about the choices we make as we design. Um, so I never see an interior space uh, as just an interior space. I see the architecture as a contributor to the interior space. So I think uh, it depends on the kind of project you have and where do you really come in. Do you come in uh, into a greenfield project at the beginning or are you refurbishing a property? So it depends a lot on, you know, where do you enter a project? Um, so, uh, you know, as a practice, we are trying to develop an internal tool so that we can take uh, conscious decisions in terms of the materials we choose. And we are trying to uh, dedicate some resources within the organization 
so that we can populate uh, what materials are green and what are not as per us, not just as per what we see printed behind a catalog, and uh, prescribe the correct materials for a project. Uh, that's one of the ways that we are trying to adopt uh, for most of our projects that we are taking on. Uh, also, coming back to uh, one of the questions that you asked, Bobby, on, you know, Italian marble. Uh, my question is, why Italian marble, you know, uh, or why marble, uh, so to say? I think we need to start questioning the very basis of uh, what we are traditionally uh, used to thinking uh, in terms of design. We are very used to putting marble in a, in a hotel lobby. There can be various other ways to address this. Uh, uh, for example, if we are using marble in a certain part, we could use its wastage uh, and cast it into terrazzo, uh, sorry, cast it into a terrazzo flooring. Uh, it will give us a beautiful effect. Uh, it will be polished enough to look good. So there are various ways uh, to rethink uh, uh, a design solution. So this is where uh, we try and, uh, you know, sort of question and try and think out of the box. For example, if we say are building a project which is close to the sea, we'd perhaps, uh, you know, even go to the extent of thinking that we could uh, source uh, all the waste that sort of lands up uh, on the seashore, uh, maybe weave it into uh, panels and use it on a ceiling instead of a traditional false ceiling. Uh, we could look at, uh, say, using laterite and cast it into concrete on a floor. Uh, uh, you know, we could use reclaimed wood uh, to do paneling in a project. Uh, so there, there are various ways uh, to be sustainable. Uh, we are also internally working on, uh, you know, uh, maybe integrating our uh, textile crafts and using uh, those materials as alternate uh, upholstery fabrics. Because I feel that it's just all getting very prescriptive and uh, very, you know, so to say, uh, mundane and boring. Uh, so, we are trying to be sustainable in a slightly different way by being out of the box, by really going down to the basic questions of questioning every little, uh, you know, decision that we make and trying to not just uh, be, uh, you know, uh, do what we're used to doing, but trying to think of everything in a slightly different way. So, that's, that's what, you know, what we are trying to do. Bobby. The way I have been doing recently um, projects that has to be sustainable at the same time, making it luxurious at a low cost, is something I explored because of some of my family background that really helped me. I come from a background of theater from my parents' side. Being on stage, creating that set, creating some sort of a fantasy space, you know. We live in a reality, we all have a normal houses, but when you go to a nice hotel, you want to be away from your reality. You Absolutely. Want to, right? You want to go into a dream space, you know, it's not, not just about, even, even if you are in a business hotel, those two nights, you know, you are spending in that hotel, you want to go back with a smile, or you feel good about coming back and sleeping in that room, or bathing there, do something sexy. And that need not necessarily mean spending big bucks. So I go back towards thinking right from the beginning in terms of how to create a theatrical experience through lighting, through innovative materials, through um, quality of spaces, how they flow into each other, volumes, heights, all these not necessarily does not cost money. There is a two-star experience to a five-star deluxe, you know, upper upscale. And this realization has happened pretty recently as I've matured as a designer, getting uh, more experience, more exposure, also hearing a lot about, you know, what's happening to the planet and what's our little contribution that you can make. So if we are able to create something very atmospheric, it's not just about, you know, um, it, it spreads across from the low segment to the high segment. You are able to do it through smart design, you know, through lighting. You know, you need not have too many lights and, you know, like control systems with so many circuits, so many light fixtures. You can do it very 
few fixtures too. Just have two, three different moods. You know, the sleeping experience is very important. How, how you know, you come up well rested. Your bathing experience. Um, so it's not necessarily about that, you know, using of Italian marble, as she said. I, I agree. In fact, we are doing that, what you just mentioned, trying to create, you know, looking for new materials. There, is, there has been a huge resurrection in this terrazzo and, you know, the old mosaic finishes. And some, it, it also starts when, you know, when, when the big fashion brands start doing it. Like Valentino as a fashion brand, they were the first ones to uh, resurrect uh, terrazzo. So when one of the big boys in the fashion industry does it, right, then that's when everyone wakes up. Wow, this is looking cool. And where did all the terrazzo go from for the showrooms? From India. They were made from India because this industry had more or less died across the country, or around the world, and there were just few surviving factories left in India that still knew how to do it. So, you know, so we do need the backing of some of the... Um, uh, big brands to sort of, you know, champion, you know, these things to let it enter into people's mindset as to what is luxury. Now, we sometimes hit a roadblock with this, you know, because we are constantly, um, uh, the, the mindset of an average first-time hotelier who's making a five-star property, right? He already has a mindset that a hotel has to look like this. Many times the brands support us, but the owners are not convinced. Many of them are making hotels not necessarily for an ROI, you know. Unke liye hum bada mehel ROE, which is the biggest problem. Yeah. So, <laughs> to be blunt, yes. Um, so, now, now, without using that Italian marble, without that chamak, you know, a little bit of all that metal coming in and some rich materials, how do you do that? So, we are in a dharm sankat. Until Amitabh Bachchan or Virat Kohli is not aware of this country, if we don't have to do anything in this Bollywood and cricket. उन लोग जब तक ऐलान नहीं करेंगे ये हम लोग के ये we will not be able to digest it because to us they are the trendsetters तो उन लोग यू नो टीवी में आके यू नो जैसे पान पराग बेचते हैं या वो सब कर रहे राइट ये सब चीज में भी अगर उन लोग ध्यान दे तो शायद ओके आई थिंक यू लोग ऑन ब्लैंक सॉरी या ओके सो you know, like, like, if, like, like, for you, it's like if Messi speaks something or the other big Ita uh, French yeah, s soccer player, Zidane, if, you know, he speaks, like, you would have made even further, faster progress in being green in your country, right? So we need our big boys to speak that, including our country's leadership. It's only then will it totally soak into the grassroots levels. Now, here, or as a designer, we are trying our best to try and do it. So when we have brands that you're working with, where the brands are the owners, it's very easy. So working with IHCL or working with elementary hotels, the owners are self, themselves are convinced about even those calculations that you're talking about, the mathematics of, you know, return on investment, they understand. But a first time hotel, which is a large chunk of the, of the market, you know, they are bothered about the money that they are using of their own or the loans that they're taking the least money they spend, the better, the happier yeah, they feel. They're, they're more prone to go the traditional route, so to say. They're so we are, we are in a situation where we are maturing. We need help from others. France has, is, they are, I think, 25 years ahead of us. That level of realization will dawn upon us, but we are still at a very nascent age. Now, now he has been able to do all this because he's, it's his company's philosophy. You know, They're putting in their own money. Now, you have another client, you know, from, you know, who's, 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 who's going to be your uh, owner, and you, are, you will hear the same roadblock. I'm sure. No, you are absolutely right. Uh, I think, Bobby, you answered that very well. I think 
we also need some statutory uh, push. We need to have some guardrails over there. Something to bind people to say, you know, now. <coughs> it can't it's not, be left it's not to there. anybody's it's, it's, discretion. It is there. It's not that it's not there. I mean, there are enough agencies in the country to, yeah, uh, to, to cap what you can do and what you cannot do. But, you know, the people get away with so much nowadays. So I think there has to be some kind of enforcement also. Like you said, from the top leadership, it has to flow down. So what we need is a roadmap and some enforcement around the the steps that we, uh, you know, lay out for ourselves. Okay. So uh, my final question, which will be a panel question, and then we'll open it for the audience. What is the way forward? Well, we've discussed what's happened in the past. We understand our challenges. What is the way forward in the in the short term and in the long term? And this time we'll start with you, Pierre. I think the way forward is definitely uh, the financing. I think the key and, and the constraint has to become first from the financing and second the regulatory, regulatory bodies, for sure, that have to combine some constraints. Uh, the carbon, effectively, the cost of carbon footprint, I think, should be taken into the equation because so far it's not much taken. And this is what is happening now in Europe, eh? more and more, you have to understand. We're not 25 years ahead in France and in India, but we don't get it wrong on that. I think we're just about less than 10 years ahead, but there is more constraint now in order to push uh, towards the, the carbon footprint impact uh, into, into project. And that's very, very important. Uh, you because also have very nice influencing neighbors around you. You know, the Agreed. Scandinavian countries up there, I mean, they all started and they're your neighbors and they're able to influence that whole region very well. Sure. Northern Europe is maybe 10 years ahead than France and therefore 20 years ahead than India for, sh for all these aspects, but it's, it's something important. Um, so, so I think that's really for me the step number one because without that, we're still going to be talking about the same topics in, in three years and five years and we'll see some, of course, progression, some, some, uh, you know, some quick wins, but in the end, we're not going to change drastically the way, we, the way we do things. Because overall, the tools exist, the know-how exists. I mean, you, you were mentioning Terrazzo and, and these kind of things. We've been using Terrazzo actually on the Amansara project I was mentioning in 2003. Why we use Terrazzo in Cambodia? Because at that time, there was nothing manufactured in Cambodia. So we had no choice on in Amansara than to use a Terrazzo. It was not because of cost, it was because of local constraints. And, and therefore, all this exists. Now it's become world famous as a material. It's right. become fashionable. It's become because, fashionable. You know, the Valentino brand decided to use it. You know, uh, so I agreed. Think a lot of, I think a lot of owners, designers, brands want to be sustainable, but uh, everyone's not sure how they can really uh, do this. So I think uh, having the right regulatory framework. And also, maybe if the government, uh, alongside a lot of uh, professionals who dwell in these topics, can come up with some sort of standard solutions. It could be a large bucket list that people could choose out of. They would just hasten the process because we don't have that much time, right? Uh, and if we were to leave it to the intelligence of every individual or every company, I don't think we're getting anywhere. So I think we really need to work with some government body on this. I want to do that. I, I want to do it for free. That, you know, can I provide some service to a government body and be a part of uh, something good that can come out for, uh, you know, the larger, uh, a larger audience. So if we can do something like that, it can really make a fast, uh, a quick difference. I think it's a, it's a process. Uh, I think majorly, I think what needs to be done is awareness at all levels. I think the awareness is going to come through maybe the advertising from Amitabh Bachchan and Virat Kohli, possibly. Or, or some arm twisting, you know, or from the government. Twisting. You know, like uh, the Ozo ozone layer depleting. It took a long time for people to realize what was happening and yeah. it's eventually now closing up. So at least people have understood. So like similarly, this is also going to take its time. Only thing we have to move fast, the time is gone. <laughs> Actually, it's, we don't have the time. It's, it's, time to, it's time to do more than start thinking of what to do now. It's, we've come to that stage. Well, I'm I think seeing another positive change and it just came to my mind that you know, India is a party to the World Economic Forum and we've sort of signed up to be a part of uh, achieving certain sustainable development goals. Uh, I think by 2030, if I'm not wrong. And what I'm seeing uh, happen in school curriculums for little children is that uh, 
studying the SDG goals, uh, doing projects on them, and actually learning about them is happening today in schools. I'm seeing my own daughter uh, do that as you know, multiple projects through the year. And I think it's a great thing because we are basically shaping the mindset of the next generation who are going to be taking decisions very soon. In the next 10 years, they'll be ready to take decisions. So I think that's probably, uh, you know, obviously filtering down from the government as a mandate. So that's one positive change that I am seeing happen. And I do see my daughter come up to me and talk about these things and question me and, you know, raise pertinent questions. So it, it's great that this is happening at least at, at the grassroots, at the ground level. Cyril. Well, thanks, Bobby, because a lot of my clients have been talking to me about Terrazzo lately, so now I know where it's coming from. <laughs> I was really surprised. Um, and, uh, but we, we had the same experience when we built a hotel in Sri Lanka. You know, the, one of the designers proposed that we put granite everywhere on the floor. And I thought, oh my God, we have to put this granite on a ship. It has to go halfway around the world. And, uh, and I think after I spoke to Gohan, who was there, who was you know, helping us with the interior design, we decided to do a pebble wash, a white pebble wash. It's beautiful. And, you know, it was done locally by an old man, 60 years old. He's, you know, he's been doing this all his life. So we, we, you know, we gave work to the local craftsmen, and carbon footprint was probably much lesser than, <laughs> than granite. Um, so, look, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Just one thing I thought, if we were able to measure all this carbon footprint, you know, if we could tell, okay, you know what, this site, we have emitted so much tons of carbon so far, or we're staying in this Hilton, what's the performance of this Hilton in terms of carbon emissions? You know, the same way we talk about ADR and occupancy and all that. Why don't we have, a, you know, some measurements of the carbon emissions of a hotel? And I think, you know, that would be a very uh, refreshing race for everybody to compete on another parameter than just, you know, ADR and occupancy and others. Uh, I don't know how to do it, but I thought that would be a nice thing to do. Uh, so the sense that I get is that the uh, way forward is around financing. You spoke about that. Then roadmap, uh, awareness, education, and then is the measurability. Uh, 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 an iconic Indian hotelier, uh, and it reminds me, once said, what gets measured, measured gets managed. So if you are able to ma measure uh, then obviously you will be able to uh, manage it. So, great. Uh, now I'd like to open this to the audience. If anybody has any questions, happy to take. Samir? I'll pass on the mic. So, I'm just quoting from another study in another context. It was done in the context of uh, electronic vehicles. And I think the point that this research analyst was trying to depict that these vehicles are not as clean and as green as they're made out to be, right? By the time you consider that uh, 250 grams of lithium that is needed to go into that battery, you know, how many rocks you need to fell, what the transportation is, then the disposal of the battery. So point being in this same thing, you know, talking about has the industry or the association of builders, developers, architects, I, I don't know what the body is, has anyone tried to control the narrative, put out a message, and then you, in, you know, induct Shah Rukh Khan or whoever you want to induct to say, look, this is genuinely sustainable, right? I mean, marble has certain costs and benefits. So is the bamboo construction. But what if your bamboo construction is going to go off after 10 years? And then you have to replace your HVAC or something like that. I'm making it up. But, but has that narrative been set? Has anyone evaluated end to end, not just what you see on the side? Because we are very easy to conclude on a... Uh, you know, green vehicle which doesn't use fuel and likewise a site that doesn't use marble. But has that study ever been done? Has anyone evaluated that? Uh, in parallel. So it's not, a, it's, it's like Vikram said, it's a process. 
but we're still far behind lagging in the process that is painful to see that we're still only talking about ROI in terms of pure numbers. As a business owner over here, we're all sitting in this room. I mean, it's a moral responsibility, otherwise we go the, we go the way of dinosaurs. I mean, come to ROI because it goes into sustainability. So that's right, I mean, where it goes into financing. It goes into Banks the, the green financing or whatever else. So all these frameworks have to come into play. And I think uh, they're just coming far too slowly. And I mean, all the people in, who are sitting here, all the people who have the powers to be, have to kind of dive into it sooner than later. And just use local materials. I mean, you, you mentioned that, Bobby, that local materials. I mean, I don't know why why the hell every owner wants Italian marble when we have no, such no, beautiful no, materials in India. What's happened with the big Western brands, you know, if you're all here, is that the idea of luxury, you know, it, it, it's so fixed now. You know, they want this whole word called, you know, layering. It has to be internationally acceptable. You know, that similar style is, is getting into all the brands. All the brands are now starting to look kind of similar. You know, the earlier days when you had a really nice hotel, it was nice because it had something really strong in terms of its soul and uh, design and overall atmosphere. Now, you know, someone's done a good job, one of the brands, the, all the rest will follow that. You know, so a, as a designer also, many a times we get stifled because we have to work within these certain restrictions. And the idea of that uber luxury, unless you use certain components, you know, certain ingredients in making that, you know, that, that dish, it's, it's unpalatable to them without that. So I think that kind of flexibility has to again come in, which happened, I think, 40 years ago, you know, when, when TWA started that, the hotel, right? That's yeah. right. Um, they had the strong personalities, you know, so all the big American brands, each one had a strong personality. Then they all started looking similar. So. I think technology also has a lot to do with why things are looking very similar today. Because, you know, nothing is contained within a box anymore. No one's really discovering things. I think you're discovering it way sooner than what you should as an experience. So an Uber luxury brand, I think, you know, like we saw, um, again, it's, it's from my own clients, one of my clients, right? When you see some of the big hotels, in, that we saw recently, um, it could be anywhere. It could be in Phuket, it could be in um, Dubai, it could be in some Mediterranean place, or it could be in Florida. India? Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that, that Indian hotel that looks like it could be anywhere. There was no sense of place or, you know, location because the brand says, we want that. Uh, so let's, let's consider the whole conversation in entirety as we see it now. And let's for a moment think that this is this, let's operate from a circle of influence as opposed to a circle of concern. And let's go back to the last point made of the session. What if we were able, to, just like Trust You puts a meta score out there, because who's really holding the circle of influence? The customer. So, what if you could put out your carbon consumption and make that mandatory in the customer to view and select a hotel? That would drive influence from where the money really is coming in. You see, we're looking at it internally and saying the problem is not something I can entirely solve. But if, if Trust You could do it with a meta score, why can't we do it with carbon neutral footprint? And let the customer consciously, if, we're, if there's a mindset that's changing, make the customer decide what luxury and where the money should be. That could enable change across the whole ecosystem because the customer decides. I know that's a, that's from, a specific from what you just mentioned. You know the, the one hotel, the one brand, the one in New York? Right. And they have some more now in Europe. Now you will realize this hotel is 
has its own following. They are getting more, you know, uh, ARR than any, any other hotel. They're far more naturally made and with natural materials and all that stuff. And that is because there is, a, there is also this new generation of evolved clientele that sooner or later will spread across. We're not there, but there is a lot. And these people, they, they patronize these kind of hotels. Yes, That's because they're talking about it. They, 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 they are ex ex clearly explaining the process of construction, their operations, what goes into... Point. So, so because of the fact that they're announcing this, they have, you know, they're even making business sense. They are getting that ROI. All right. So, uh, like, as you, as you very rightly said, like uh, in today's day and age, you look at a menu and you see how many calories on a particular dish. I think the, the point that this gentleman is making is that you have a process around it and on every website, let the customer choose. You see how many, what is the carbon footprint. Uh, and I think that's a very good suggestion. Uh, yeah, it, it, will, it will happen. Uh, I'd seen the lady raising her hand. So I actually have a suggestion here, which uh, Vikram, because you are really uh, coming from the operator side, and maybe that's a word that you can spread towards that community. Whenever we are looking at the design of any hotel, it's the operator's vision and operator's brand standards that actually leads the design. So where Bobby is coming from, the acceptance of, let's say, an Italian marble or uh, things like that, they all ultimately come down to us from the brand standards. Could there be a think tank, since you know this is a gathering of operators, of owners, could there be a think tank with the operators that is looking at not just operational savings, the way Vikram you described, I think that's a fantastic step, but could we have something like that for the construction industry where we are genuinely looking at things like our facades? I mean, I was just around the city and Bangalore has become a nightmare, it's a box, right? With all the glass facades and all and it's changed the microclimate of the space completely. Now, all our city hotels, unfortunately, are blocks. We've made blocks. I've made countless of them myself. So, and we, all our hotels, we have countless water bodies, for instance. Some used, some not used, some just decorative. Are we actually really thinking of that as an impact? Can the brands put that thing tank together and think that, you know, can we look at our facades differently? Can we look at our architecture differently? Right now, for instance, when we are designing for hotels in India, the narrative always starts with, okay, there's got to be some sort of a local influence. The building has to look like it's maybe in Puri or wherever the project is based. But that's such tokenism. Can't we actually look at vernacular architecture? What Gorang has done for Cyril's resort, that wash, you know, was, was completely in that space in Sri Lanka. It was suited for that. So a touch like that, can't we actually look at our designs from that point of view? Because we have all our designers, our Indian designers willing to pitch into that effort. As you know, people on the project management side, for us also, we are always looking at, uh, you know, when we are balancing our project timelines, costs, everything, we are weighing all these factors also in and more importantly, the brand standards, what the brand wants. If we can have that narrative from the brand, I'm 100% sure the projects can move in a much more green, sustainable way. And, uh, I think brands, are, brand standards are an evolving phenomenon. This, I mean, they were not cast in stone even then. Sorry. They were not cast in stone as such. Uh, as times have changed, a lot has changed in all the standards. Uh, it is very difficult to identify an interior design standard as such because eventually it also depend, depends on the designer, it depends upon the operator, it depends upon the segment that you are in. So I, I wouldn't say that do we put marble in the brand standard or not put it in the brand standard. That will eventually come from the fact what the designer wants to put for that demographic of that space, definitely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think what brands, sorry, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what brands specify is the look and feel. And then it's left to the designer and each individual owner to kind of imbibe that look and feel. I don't think any brand defines a out of the box so it's so much safer to be you know doing what everybody does and taking a bold step out you know doesn't I mean there's no reward right I don't think so I mean there is always a discussion that can always be had on this it's not oh, that you're so, <laughs> yeah I mean if it makes sense uh, definitely reward, yeah but you know I mean Things like wind, light, wind and all that, these are all spoken for. These are not, I mean, they're not even brand standards. Uh, uh, these I, are part I, of, I, yeah, it's part of the design that the MEP consultants and all will actually put in to say that this is the best thing that works for you and that will bring you the best efficiencies and stuff like that, you know. I've noticed another thing as a designer that design is becoming a function of time. You know, the amount of time you have to take it. So if we all have a little more relaxed time, like, <laughs> oh, uh, one final question. The lady has been raising her. There's a, there's, a, there's a couple of good points there. Um, I think there's got to be uh, some emphasis on supply chain, and that leads into the point about time. At the end of the day, when you're designing something, you have a timeline, you're always pushed to deliver much quicker than maybe you would like and that creativity and the opportunity to investigate what's in the market is, is, is compromised. So what do we do? We end up going back to the, the brand standards and we don't challenge them. There is opportunity, I think, to challenge the brand standards in situ. We have on a regular basis and been successful. Um, but I think my point is, I think we really have to look at our supply chain and ensuring that, um, and, are, and, and, and support the supply chain to ensure that local materials are available and that they hit all of the international standards that we need to be able to include them on, on projects when, they are, when we're dealing with international brands. And that will in turn bring confidence as well. So I think there is a big, and I think a big part of that does come from um, our leaders, the leaders in the, in the region as well, to sort of put the standards in there. And just a second point I wanted to make, I've just looked at my phone. Um, when I'm in London and I'm searching for hotels, there is a green factor, and I can't remember what it was called, and, I'm, uh, and I've just interestingly looked at the same app on my phone here in India, and it's not available for searching. So I think um, it is happening. It's happening in certain countries. It's just not happened in India yet. Um, but, you, but, but certainly the new generation is surfing and looking for the hotels based on their green factor, whatever that is. So um, it's, it's real and it's happening. That's just what I want to All right, add. great. Uh, we've completely run out, uh, run out of time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did moderating this one. Thank you.